Uh, my name is Irina Serkes. I create data visualization for opinion in the New York Times, and I'm super excited to be part of DataFest this year. Those are really strange times we are living in right now, but I believe as any challenging um, event, they kind of provoke us to be even more creative about the way we approach different things. So yeah, let's talk about how we can tell uh, COVID-19 stories with non-COVID data. All right, oopsie. Um, so it's a common practice in journalism world to plan media coverage in advance. We need to be sufficiently staffed during certain events, prepare assets and data, build event-specific infrastructure and APIs, and generally do everything possible to uh, have a head start during the major news storm. So here is a very simplistic representation of how we imagined 2020 would look like. How naive we were, <laughs> right? Um, we knew this would be a busy year. Debates, primaries, elections, Summer Olympics, plus probably also a continuation of Tariff Saga and a bunch of other events I didn't mention here, but two months ago, everything changed. The life we knew before was put on hold. Millions lost their jobs, thousands died. Um, and uh, Olympics and many other major events got postponed. Many election events got rescheduled or canceled. Suddenly, every breaking story is a COVID story. The way we thought about things, the way we did things and planned them, everything is being revised and reevaluated now. Naturally, that with the event of this scale and magnitude, there is way more to the story than just death rates, confirmed cases, are not or vaccines. Global pandemics is affecting almost every single aspect of our life, and that's our job to find tools and data to better understand this phenomenon, to look at things from you know, a different perspective. Since I started at the opinion, which surprisingly coincided with the start of coronavirus pandemic in Europe and US, shout out to everyone who changed the job during pandemic or did it. <laughs> um, I didn't really work on solely pandemic projects, but I was lucky to contribute to a bunch of stories that help interpret this new world we are all living in. We were uh, one of the first to play with the mobility data. The idea was not only to show the decline, uh, but try to explore some regional and cultural differences. Uh, so we ended up with this four-dimensional chart, which I think worked really well in showing how blue and red states reacted to the spread of the virus, controlling for the intensity of the spread. A few days later, another amazing mobility story, which I was really jealous of, this time from our newsroom friends, uh, Jennifer Valentino de Riz, Dennis uh, Lu, and Gabrielle Dance compared mobility uh, patterns between poor and wealthy areas and proved once again that coronavirus is far from being a great equalizer and working from home is a luxury not everyone could afford. And I thought that was really, really smart to, you know, add this one additional layer of data and kind of try to interpret it from that perspective. Fast forward two months and another brilliant mobility story this time analyzing uh, mail forwarding requests as a prop proxy of where people moved to wait out the storm. Uh, you know, the economic impact of the global pandemics is by all means devastating. But to better understand why so many people are struggling these days, we need to look into economic and social circumstances that preceded coronavirus crisis. I was surprised to learn that most Americans don't have enough emergency savings to last three months. This was really strange to me, frankly. Back then, unemployment rates were historically low, economy was booming, uh, but still two-thirds low-income Americans didn't have rainy funds whatsoever. Then I looked closer into income and expenses data, and suddenly it all made sense. Uh, obviously, it's hard to build up an emergency fund if you almost have no discretionary income and if it takes you more than two years to save an equivalent of one month of expenses. So for this story, we kind of switched the perspective and, uh, you know, rather than telling 
how long your uh, savings would last you, we decided to show how long it takes you to build up this fund, which was really, a really strong point. Because, you know, good luck uh, living two years without having no emergency situation or unexpected medical bill. Um, the same as with the previous story, long before the world was hit by the coronavirus, Opinion was uh, planning to run this massive series about inequality in the US. And this really hit the nerve because again, to understand today's struggles, we should not only look into the severity of the virus spread, but also uh, at the events that preceded it. So in early April, we ran 20 plus chart story trying to shed some light on every social economic aspect that left so many Americans vulnerable. Um, and as economic crisis was deepening, it was becoming clear that bailouts are inevitable, but who should get them? That was a valid question. And uh, we look at how coronavirus affected sales in hospitality industry and which companies were uh, sporging on stock buybacks before, way before the crisis hit. Clearly, some of them could use those money now. As countries worldwide uh, are trying to restart uh, their economies, important question is how dangerous it might be to reopen certain businesses. So my colleagues from Opinion analyzed uh, anonymized cell phone data to measure how uh, crowded, uh, how certain businesses could get crowded and how this could affect the resurgence of COVID-19. It turned out that some businesses, just like some people, could be super spreaders. In terms of contagiousness, a yoga class or a crowded neighborhood bar um, may look a lot like that market in China. Obviously, cell phone data has its limitations. Uh, it doesn't show how people interact, how often they touch surfaces, or in some cases, um, whether people are indoors or outdoors. So my colleagues asked uh, people to rate on scale one to 10, um, they asked people to rate on scale one to 10 how often people interacted with other people or touched shared surfaces at various businesses, as well as how many activity uh, was going on uh, in different sectors, indoors or outdoors. So as a result, this massive scatter plot of how uh, risky it might be to reopen different um, sectors of the economy. And here we are, misinformation and evergreen story uh, under every circumstances. A few years, a weeks ago, researchers from Stanford, Stanford University released a paper stating that COVID-19 infections uh, in Santa Clara, California, might well be uh, 85 times higher than official estimates uh, with the fatality rate as low as 0.12%, um, uh, which would make COVID-19 uh, only as deadly as the seasonal flu. Scientific community criticized the research's statistical methods, recruitment methods, which were just Facebook ads, and uh, Chinese tests, which were at that point already banned from export. But that was a uh, way after this paper went viral and was shared hundreds of times by right-wing commentators to back up their political agenda. All right, if using social economic data is quite straightforward, how about telling the story of grateful New Yorkers by measuring clapping sound levels? Frankly, I think it's brilliant and by far my favorite non-COVID data COVID chart. Um, so yeah, that's all being said, that's just obviously a tip of the iceberg. We are just in the beginning of our pandemic and hopefully someday soon post-pandemic media coverage. And if you are yet not tired of COVID news, eventually you will be. So we'd better get more creative um, about how we approach data. And here are some a few quick tips to kickstart your brainstorming uh, for the next project. So. Uh, think about multidimensionality of your data. One uh, data sort is almost never an answer. Think, uh, think about unconventional uh, data sources, something like peer-reviewed studies or geospatial data or even audio. 
you know, information is almost everything and you could use it uh, for your advantage. Think beyond what and when, uh, ask why and how, and never just describe the data, always explain, and if possible, try to predict or estimate what is coming next. You know, simulations, all sorts of simulations and uh, different models are uh, really powerful in these days. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Uh, wash your hands and um, stay safe.